A time to thank and praise God. Let's talk to God together. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us safely to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power so that we will not dishonour you or be overcome by the hardships of life. And in all we do today, direct us and help us to do your good will. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Hello. Will and that was Maxi. And we're doing English Spot this morning from Korea. Today we are learning three pieces of English that will be in the Bible talk. Imitate, walk the walk, and submit. The first word we are looking at is imitate. It's a verb. If you imitate someone, you copy them. You copy the way that they speak or behave. If you imitate someone, you want to be like them. They are your role model. Sometimes, however, you can imitate someone as a way of making fun of them. In this picture, actor Mr. Alec Baldwin was imitating the former US President, President Trump. President Trump responded by tweeting, Alex is trying to save his dying mediocre career with this terrible impersonation of me. Example one, Elvis Presley is one of the most copied entertainers in the world. Although he died over 40 years ago, there are Elvis impersonators in almost every country. The impersonators imitate his singing style, 
his clothes, his hair, and of course, his famous dancing style. Example two. Some people say that sons love to imitate their fathers. What do you think? So it's now time for a discussion with the people you're with or on the WhatsApp group. Can you imitate any of the following? One, a famous person. Two, an animal. Or three, someone in your family. The next bit of English is a phrase, walk the walk. If you walk the walk, then you do what you say you believe in. Your actions match what you say. You show other people what you believe in through your actions, not your words. Other people can see what is important to you by looking at how you live. Example one, parenting expert, Ms. Shannon Younger, thinks it's great when parents want their own children to read more. However, she says that if parents really want to encourage their kids to become readers, then the parents need to walk the walk. She says it's critical that kids see their own parents reading books too. Example two, the opposition leader said, we have heard the president do a lot of talking over the last few months, but what we need more than that, we need him to walk the walk and do what he has been telling us to do. The last bit of English is a verb, submit. To submit is to let yourself be under another person's authority or control. It is to do what someone else tells you to do. Most of us submit ourselves to the laws of the country we live in. We also submit to people who have, have authority like the police and judges. If you submit too often or too easily, you might be described as being very submissive. When someone is too submissive, we can say they are under the thumb. Example one, in today's society, people who submit to others are often seen as being weak. But it's good advice to submit to good people.
who are wise and fair. What do you think? Example two. Several members of the US Congress have asked that President Biden immediately submit himself to a cognitive test. They claim the president is suffering from mental decline and increasing forgetfulness, which is affecting his ability to do his duties as president. They are urging the president to follow the example of former President Trump who did the same thing in 2018. Now it's time for a discussion. In each picture, who should submit? A, the big sumo or the little sumo. B, the bullfighter or the bull. C, the blue car or the red car. And in D, the dog or the man. So the words we learnt today that will help us with the Bible passage are imitate, walk the walk, and submit. Thank you. A time to hear and think about God's word. Before we hear God's word, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us in the Bible. And thank you for inviting us to come into your kingdom by entrusting our lives to Jesus Christ. As you speak to us this morning, we ask that you will help us to listen with eager ears and to obey with joyful hearts. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Today's reading is from Ephesians chapter 5. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God, because a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good 
and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi friends, it is unfortunate that we are meeting online this time around, but it is great to see you all again. And praise God that we do not need to stop gathering amid the pandemic. For those who haven't met me before, or those who think I look familiar but have forgotten my name, I'm Sam. I came with the Sydney Uni Mission Team in December 2019 and had a really great time with a lot of the church members before COVID was even a thing. It all sounds like decades ago now. So before we start, how about let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in this time, we have the technology that you have provided so that we can still gather all around on the internet, um, praising you, Lord. Um, we have recorded songs that we can sing and we can still listen to your words, read your Bible. Lord, we pray that um, you can continue to help us to understand the words that you want us to understand and continue to be closer to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today we're going to take a break from Acts and look at one of the letters that Paul wrote, a letter in the, to the Ephesians. We'll go through chapter 5, verse 1 to 21, the section right before the popular passage on husband and wife relationship and the armor of God. And later on in Acts, we'll learn more about Paul's ministry in, Ephes in Ephesus and the challenges he faced there. But now, let me give you a quick summary um, on the background of this city and this book. So Ephesus was one of the busiest city among the Roman Empire at the time of writing. People from different cultural and social backgrounds, people worshiping different gods, come to trade and do business in Ephesus. And also basing on chapter three and chapter six, it is widely believed that Paul wrote this in prison. And so in this book, Paul started off with our blessings in Jesus and the seal of the Spirit, and talks about the supremacy of Christ. Then he talks about the mystery of the gospel, that it is not only for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, that we are all united in Christ as one body because of the gospel. Then Paul moved on talking about how we should live as one body in Christ. Even though we all come from different backgrounds, living among different hierarchies. Paul talks, talks about how we should interact with brothers and sisters when we are also husband and wife, parents and children, masters and slaves. Finally, he wraps up with the armor of God, the things that we need to wear every single day to stand firm in Christ and against evil. And in this section today, Paul starts by commanding us to be imitators of God. And immediately, we can come up with two questions. Why and how? So we will talk about the why first. Why do we be imitators of God? 
It is because we are his dear children. Or in another translation, as beloved children. This sentence alone is huge. For some of us, after going to church for many years, we might have become accustomed in calling God Heavenly Father. But what does it really mean to call God as our Father? And understanding that we are His beloved children. Paul reminded us this in chapter 1. In love, God, pred God predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in Jesus. God has adopted us into his own family because of what Jesus did. Jesus died for our sin and rose again. Paul explained and elaborated on this in chapter 1 to 3 of Ephesians which I really encourage you to read after this service. God adopting us is based on his love. But more than this is that he has decided on it in advance. And this is what he wanted to do. He called us beloved children, like how he called Jesus his beloved son in Matthew. It is almost impossible for me to express fully how wonderful and amazing this is. But if you remember the story of the prodigal son, this might help you to understand the magnitude of this act of God. So in Luke chapter 15, Jesus, Jesus shared a parable, a story with messages. And I will retell it in my own words. There was a father with two sons. The youngest son told his father to divide the property, divide up all the money. He was treated like his father is dead. And then the youngest son left the family and spent his father's money in reckless living. Drinking, gambling, going to brothels. But since then, the father had been waiting. He had been waiting for this son this rebellious son to return. After spending all the money, the youngest son finally realized how ridiculous he was. He figured this out while he was almost needing to fight with pigs for food as the lowliest person in town. But at least he realized finally. And so when the youngest son decided to go back home, not to be a son, but to be a servant because he knows he doesn't deserve to be called a son anymore. His father, as though he has been waiting for this and longing for this to happen, adopted his youngest son back to the family. There are many more about this story, but what I wanted to illustrate is the contrast between the rebellious act of the youngest son and the loving acts of the Father. God, our Heavenly Father, has willingly adopted us back into His family. It is long decided and out of great love. And so in response, what should we do? Paul commanded us, be imitator of our Father. Paul is not just, Paul is not just suggesting but commanding us that this is the appropriate way for us to respond as children of God. Have you heard of the phrase, like father, like son? It is a saying that sons are often like their fathers. We want it or not. Somehow, our behaviors and attitudes are affected by our fathers, whether good or bad. Many of my friends and relatives, including my wife, who know both me and my father, say that I'm a lot like my father. I didn't really like that in the beginning. Not because my father is bad, but I wanted to be different. There are things about my father that 
I just don't find attractive. But then there are also many things, many good things that I learned from my father, which I'm really thankful for. I know that we don't all have fathers, let alone good fathers. And for some of us, it might be upsetting or even traumatic to think about him. But it is not the case with our Heavenly Father. He's always present, full of compassion and love, justice and forgiveness, and mercy and grace. Paul has instructed us to imitate our Heavenly Father, the one who adopted us because of love. So how then, how should we imitate God? What does Paul really mean by that? After all, we can't separate the Red Sea nor turn water into wine. In this passage, Paul has given us three points on how do we imitate God. Firstly, we walk in love. Then we walk in light. And we walk in wisdom. So first, how do we walk in love? When someone asks you, what is love? What do you usually think of? For me, it's usually the famous love passage in 1 Corinthians 13 that comes to my mind. But here, Paul went to the fundamental and answered this question with the gospel. This is what he said. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Christ's love is, selfless, is a selfless love, a self-sacrificing love. I have always imagined that self-sacrifice as a one-off event of perhaps physically protecting someone in a dark alley or to die heroically for others, like what we usually see in movies. But I finally learned that it is actually not that simple. So I got married last year, and in the beginning, my wife would sometimes complain about my selfish act. And I would, in my heart, think that, wait till the right situation come, then you will know how much I love you. I was thinking of those one-off heroic acts. But what I really get to learn and slowly learn is that sacrificial love is way, way, way more than that. It is not just a one-off act, which sometimes we might depict what Jesus has done. But it is a continuous act of sacrificing your own selfish desire to do the housework that you don't want to do, to give up some old hobbies and develop new ones so that you can enjoy more time together. These are things that require effort and dedication, not just a simple passion. Here, Paul didn't contrast love with hate, which is what we usually think of. But instead, he contrasts love with sexual immorality impurity and greed, which is also idolatry. When we engage in these things, we are in love with something else that's other than God. We are in love with ourselves, our own desire, or we are in love with the world, who tells us to either please others or to satisfy ourselves. To walk in love is to give up your own desire for God, this is what Jesus has done for us. He came to earth and lived a lowly life for us for 33 years, not just a day or two, and then he died for us. God has high standards in terms of how we, he would like us to respond to him. There are things that he considered proper among his people, the saints, those he set apart for himself. In God's kingdom, there is absolutely no place for sexual immorality, impurity, nor greed. And it is not just about not engaging in sex outside of marriage, 
nor stealing things. Paul mentioned not even filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Paul said, instead, let there be thanksgiving. When you are tempted to speak with bad temper or want to join in a dirty joke conversation, try to think, of, try to think about thanksgiving. It won't be easy, but when you're able to do it, it will surely calm you down. So going back to the lessons I learned in my marriage, there are times when my wife and I had heated arguments, I was so tempted to just say stupid things. And praise God, the Holy Spirit had times and times saved my life. He reminds me of thanksgiving and reminding me of the beauty of our marriage. Thanksgiving helps me to pause and step back from the selfish mindset and have a more holistic picture of my life, which helps me to understand what is important and what is not. The thing that I always give thanks for, even when it is hard to think of, is that Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us when we are still sinners, when we are undeserving, when we are still terrible. When you are tempted in sin and you are aware of it, Try to think of things you should give thanks to. Through it, your heart will be opened up for the voice of the Spirit to remind you what is really important in life. And so after talking about love, Paul then talks about calling us to walk as children of light. In the passage, he reminds us that we're all once in darkness, but now we're in light. In verse 14, Paul quoted a possibly old hymn to illustrate this further. This is not a song that can be found in Psalm or anywhere in the Bible. So I suspect it might be an old Christian song that they sing in their gatherings. The song says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Here, that means darkness which is our old selves. And it is telling us that Jesus will shine on us. And so wake up from our sin. In chapter 4, Paul talked about this as putting off your old self and putting on the new self. When we walk in light, we take no part in darkness. First 7 says, do not become partners with them. So I'm not sure whether you have heard of this, or your culture has, might have something similar. But in contemporary Chinese culture, especially among girls, a lot of them think that their bed is a holy land, like a sac sacred place. Anything unclean cannot touch it, let alone be on it. You cannot sit on the bed before you shower. If your clothes are dirty, you cannot touch it. There are no exceptions. Friends, guests, parents, husband, none is forgivable. The bed is sacred. The bed is separate from the unclean world. And we ought to be like this. When Jesus saves us, he separates us from the unclean and makes us holy and blameless. Not that we will then live a perfect life, but that we should now see sin as something so dirty that we want to have nothing to do with it. So first, because of love, we do not take part in sins. Now, because we're in our new self, filled with the Spirit, under the light shines by Jesus, we ought to separate ourselves from sinful acts. But this is easier said than done. I myself is a sinner also, I'm always tempted to do things that I shouldn't. And when I'm tempted, it's sometimes difficult to just pause and restrain myself through willpower. But this, that's why the scripture is just full of wisdom. It says, instead of getting drunk, be filled with the Spirit. It's just unwise to put yourself into a situation where you can't resist any temptation. And so gather with brothers and sisters that will remind each other the truth, the gospel, through psalms and hymns 
and spiritual songs. Gather with people who also enjoy singing and making melody to the Lord with their heart. This is very important. After saving us, God didn't just leave us alone in this evil time and wait for his return. Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. And not only that, Jesus built the church, the body of Christ, so that we can strengthen one another in the name of Jesus. COVID is a difficult time, and we might have used to the convenience of attending online church, listening to the best sermons all around the world while sitting on our comfy couch. But my dear friends, the Bible has taught us that we don't just go to church to gain, but to give. We ought to support one another. It's not just a volunteer or owner alone that take care of everyone. We are one body in Christ, a big family. And being available and turning up, of course, when the situation allows, is one of the biggest assets to your family. So through these principles, this is how we should submit to one another as one body in Christ. In love, as light, and with wisdom, out of reference for Christ. So walk in love. Remember the gospel through thanksgiving. Walk in light. Remember how the gospel transforms us, that we are now in light and not in darkness. And walk in wisdom. Remind one another the gospel in gatherings. Speak the truth through songs and the scripture. Thanks. So we're all going to share the Lord's Supper in a moment, but first we're going to sing.
we're going to share in the Lord's Supper and remember what Jesus did to free us for a, a new life, a refreshing life, a good life, where we get to do things with Jesus by our side. So friends, if you have turned to God and are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you are eagerly waiting for God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come again from heaven, this same Jesus who was raised from the dead and who saves us from the judgment which is coming soon, then this meal is for you. Now, if you haven't turned back to God, if you're not trusting in Jesus, if you're not living with Jesus in your life each day, just let the, um, the bread and the juice go past you. That's fine. But we do look forward to the day when you too will share in this meal as our brother and sister in the Lord. Now, friends, before we share in the Lord's Supper, we must examine ourselves. After all, we are the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, his people on earth. Therefore, we must confess our sin and be united in our fellowship together. And so I'm going to give you just a few minutes to sit there quietly. Please forget about everyone else around you. Maybe close your eyes. And I would like you to talk to God. Talk to the one who stands next to you and ask him to search you, to look inside your spirit and to bring up into your mind the things that he would like you or he would like to talk to you about, the things that we need to confess to him. So I'll give you just a minute or two. Sit there quietly and then we will confess our sins by saying a short prayer together. Friends, let us confess our sins to Almighty God using the words that you can see there on the screen. Let's say these words together. Heavenly Father, you love us so much, but we don't always love you. We cause you shame when we don't obey you. We are often proud, but you are good and very kind. Please forgive us, make us clean and change us. Enable us to live for you, and to please you in every way. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Friends, God is very patient with us. He forgives anyone who turns to him and trusts in his son Jesus to be their saviour and Lord. So now we are friends with God and part of his family. We can say together, praise, praise the Lord. We thank you especially for Jesus, our Saviour. We thank you that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and to bring us forgiveness. We thank you that he was raised to life again, to give us a new life where we live with you through the Holy Spirit, working in us each day. Amen. Friends, the night before he died, Jesus ate supper with his disciples. He thanked God and gave them the bread and said these words, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. And after the supper, he gave the cup to his followers and he said, Drink from this cup. This is my blood that seals the new agreement between God and people. I give my life for you and many others so your sins can be forgiven. Every time you drink this together, Remember me. Together, we are different people, but we are one in the Lord. Jesus died for us, and so we share together, and he returns. Friends, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the freedom. We celebrate the, the refreshment, the joy, the restoration that Jesus has won for us. And we proclaim three things to ourselves, to each other, and to this world. His perfect sacrifice made once for all on the cross, his resurrection, and his going to heaven in glory. So in a few minutes, when you eat the bread, remember that Christ died for you. He set you free from sin and death. So be thankful forever. And then as you drink from the cup, remember that Jesus gave his lifeblood for you. So be thankful forever. Friends, as you eat the bread, remember that Jesus died for you to set you free from sin and death, to give you a new life of refreshment 
and joy and purpose where you live with him each day for his name. And friends, as you drink from the cup, remember that Jesus shed his lifeblood for you to free you from sin and death and to give you a new life. So be thankful forever. Now we have a short prayer of thanks that we'll say. Let's say these words together. Thank you, Father, for the guarantee that we shall eat and drink with Jesus Christ when he comes again in the glory of his kingdom. Father, remember your people. By your spirit, enable us to live for you each day. Help us to live holy lives, to tell others about Jesus, and to eagerly await for his return. Amen. Amen. Uh, friends, we're going to uh, finish the service today by blessing each other using these words that are taken from the Old Testament. So what I would like you to do is look at the people near you uh, and as you say these words, really try and focus on the word bless. So let's say these words together. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look straight at you and give you peace. Amen. Enjoy your morning tea.